It's a new week, and we are certainly pleased that you've joined us on the Monday edition of the Sports Line Podcast. I'm Bubba O'Neill. Hey, if you are kind of checking us out for the very first time, this is the place where we chat and get personal with sports top dogs at Southern Ontario, and in particular, the Golden Horse you have to offer. And today, because it's Monday, we'll also do a little square off. Born and raised right here in Hamilton, this championship volleyball player began his media career as a high school student doing play-by-play on Cable 14. After completing both his programs at McMaster and Mohawk College, Bill Malley returned to his roots and was hired as the Marauders' first full-time sports information officer way back in 1989. Way back. During his era, Bill made his mark in the media as an assistant coach. When the microphone was put in his hand, he entertained it informed as McMaster's public address announcer and there was so much more in between now retired we're certainly lucky to have this Hall of Famer here on the Sports Line podcast Bill Malley it's been way too long I'm so glad that you've joined us here to talk about some of the things that you did and accomplished while at McMaster as a Hamiltonian too and that's what's special for us well I really appreciate the invitation to be on Sports Line and of course one of the highlights was the season you and I did on uh, radio calling McMaster Marauder football games well that would have been the 20 19 Yates Cup. I mean, and doing so, as you and I will remember so well, winning that Yates Cup right in London, right in Bill Mar- in, in a Greg Marshall's house. That was a special thing. It was a lot of fun. You know, what have you been up to ever since? Well, uh, of course, COVID mm-hmm. uh, impacted everybody. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, McMaster and I parted ways in just before the COVID epidemic hit. Mm-hmm. So at that point, I looked around and I thought, I'm going to retire. <laughs> <laughs> My wife was uh, okay with it. So that was the big question. And uh, so I've really just stepped away. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, I, I started doing some writing. So I have a couple of writing projects that I'm working on. Mm-hmm. Nothing that I really think has too much commercial value, but mm-hmm. it's more just for the exercise. Well, that's so cool that, that you get to do that kind of thing. But your journey, as I said, way back in 89, right? Coming out of school and all the things that you did. I mean, I would consider when we look back at your career at, at at McMaster like so much accomplished and you saw so many people and I think even when you take it to another level you made a mark on so many students lives because I say Bill Malley to a, a number of generations of people and they know who you are well that's very kind of you to say and, and that was a big part of of the whole experience at McMaster and uh, I really enjoyed that element of getting to know student athletes and and being part of their experience at McMaster and part of my job was of course to make sure their student athlete experience was as close Mm -hmm. to an NCAA experience Mm -hmm. as uh, as we could provide and Mm -hmm. so uh, we worked hard at that Um, the university uh, was far far different when I started than it is now in terms of facilities and programs and uh, success on and off the field. But, uh, you know, it's been nice to see the evolution and uh, I still go to games regularly. And I was going to ask you that question because you were so immersed in it. Do you, are you still a fan? I am. I am a fan. Uh, there's some personal relationships, Steph Potasic and Pat Tatum and mm-hmm. Dave Preston. They're good friends of mine. Uh, mm-hmm. Other coaches, Tim Lukes. I've known Tim Lukes since I was a student at McMaster. So it, it, it's no trouble for me to actually uh, go to the uh, Burridge gym. And I last couple of years that they've hosted volleyball nationals mm-hmm. has been a lot of fun. I, and you were going right there. And I was going to go right there. What happened last, uh, you know, last spring with the volleyball nationals? Like, that's something to remember like that I mean obviously McMaster did not win they were there competing Brock University also there competing what an event that was and that gym if you've never I keep I told people this if you've never been there for an event like that at that level it's high skill high excitement can't miss stuff Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I've watched so many university sports contests over the years that, uh, you know, it, it's it's high entertainment. It's really good quality competition. And uh, last March, when the uh, Marauder women's team hosted the Nationals, they did a tremendous job of putting on that event. The uh, Unfortunately, the Marauders had a tough draw and they lost to the eventual champions from UBC. Mm-hmm. But then they came back and they won the consolation title. And what I was very encouraged by was that even though the host team lost early, 
the McMaster and Hamilton communities still rallied and attendance was pretty solid through the weekend. Here's a question for you, and because of your experience, I really would respect your response to this. What does, or at least what has to happen in media for you sports to get to another level where, now, will it ever become NCAA pipe dream? But I still think there's room for it to grow. I think there is. Um, there's, there's always going to be challenges. I think if you look back at the 2011 Vanier Cup, when McMaster and Laval played that classic game. Best game ever. Best game ever. And it was also a huge audience for that TSN uh, viewership. So it can be done. The problem is that I think we're seeing media shrinking uh, all across the board. There are other platforms, but they may not have the reach. I like that. Uh, U Sports and OUA have tried to do more online with, you know, OUA TV and uh, CBC Gem broadcasts, but you have to make it easy for your product to be seen by the viewing public, and without a national carrier, like. It's tough, so I would like to see them work hard to get back on a national television platform. CACH was the flagship for our university sport for a long time. Game of the Week was the best advertisement for U Sports that you will ever see. It really was, and I, I've, we've discussed this on this program before that someone like myself, you know, a high school football player, you watch those games because you dream to get to that next level playing you know, on, on the game of the week, whether you're at McMaster, whether you're at Western or Guelph, any of these schools and to have your to be out there and seen playing these games like it just, it almost didn't get any better. What it used to turn into was almost like uh, college game day. Yes. Whenever game of the week came to your school there was a buzz on campus and you knew that you were going to have a bigger turnout than usual because the student population really wanted to get out there and show off for the TV audience mm -hmm. and they turned out in better numbers when the game was on TV which is almost paradoxical right and, and football I think being the highlight but it did extend to other sports in terms of basketball uh, and university hockey as well too which seems to have taken a step back I think that's fair to say um, basketball was always a big ticket item hockey you know, it struggles with its competition with Major Junior A. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm glad to see that volleyball has started to really gain some traction with a public audience. Mm -hmm. So um, all of those things used to be on Game of the Week. And uh, I think they're currently available online through most of the conferences and the schools. Yeah. Um, but like I said, you know, having that regular presence on TSN, Sportsnet, uh, CHCH, mm -hmm. whoever the carrier might be, I think we'd go a long way towards promoting university sport. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly with you, and I tell, I do tell people, and people do ask me if that'll ever come back, and it's had certain incarnations right here on CHCH. I know uh, we carried the Van Yates Cup, sorry, the the, uh, the Yates Cup there for about three or four, five mm -hmm. years, kind of carrying and whatever. I think money has got a lot to do with it. I mean, you get those HD trucks out there; it's almost a million dollars. People don't understand that that it costs that much to run those trucks right now and and if it's not kind of being come back the money's kind of not coming back either through ratings or sponsorship you know it just doesn't work i mean we talk about the vanier cup tsn and sports that carried every year and as you said with all due respect to cbc and cbc gem just not the same i agree yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, TSN, I mean, you're talking about a sports network. Mm -hmm. Sportsnet's the same. CBC has a great tradition in covering sports, particularly amateur and Olympic sports, mm -hmm. but I think that their focus is never going to be on university sport to the same degree. Uh, that being said, I, I'm sure that U Sports is thrilled to have them as a broadcast partner, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think that uh, you really have to try and figure out a way to deal with the costs. Mm -hmm. uh, resources are, are always, you know, scarce uh, at the university level. So whether you want to devote your sponsorship revenue towards helping defray some broadcasting costs, maybe you do that. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, but it's, it, it's, a, it's an age old question mm -hmm. that is hard to answer. Best part about it though for I think not only McMaster sports but OUA sports, more sports being played by men and women than ever 
we've seen. Oh, the numbers are great. Um, and, you know, you see uh, the number of programs uh, expanding, especially in OUA. Uh, and there's some great stuff happening. I mean, uh, I never would have thought that uh, university curling would, would be such a, a popular sport. But, you know, McMaster's actually, just because I check out their website occasionally, you know, their curling program's doing very well. Um, other sports like wrestling and swimming have always been very competitive. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to know that, you know, there's, there's opportunities for, for young people to compete in the sport that they like. I've warmed you up. You ready for a little square off? <laughs> oh, we can try it. Sure. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Hey, Tiger Cats, come back. Comes up a little short in a 32 to 24 loss to the Stampeders at McMahon Stadium. What else is new? Are you encouraged with what you saw? And is this Sunday's home opener versus the Sasky Rough Riders a must win situation, Bill? I really think it is a must-win situation. I, I was encouraged. I watched the game on Friday night, mm -hmm. and Bo Levi Mitchell looked like he might be closer back to the old Bo than what we saw last year. Mm -hmm. But you know, the the drops by the receivers were troubling. Uh, and I really the way the schedule breaks down, and I took a look at it. If they lose to Saskatchewan and then have to go back to Saskatchewan for the second half of a back-to-back, -back, they could start the season 0-3. And, and I don't think they're going to sweep Ottawa this year the way they did last year. Well, I mean, but a slow start because, you know, I'll, you're right. For whatever reason, the schedule makers, when it comes to the Tiger Cats, they're always kind of front load those or back load their home games more in the second half, which might be a better thing. you got to make those trips out west. But... Um, <clears throat> I, it's tough to say, and, I, and I, you don't want to be such a downer after just one game because it is one loss. But if I feel like if the Tiger Cats are 0-3, I feel like they've been 0-3 almost every season, and then they make this <laughs> wild rally to the postseason. It's kind of what they do. That is true. Right? That is true. And maybe once they get some of their injured players back, the, mm -hmm. the, they'll kind of – be closer to the team that Scott Milanovic wants them to be. Mm -hmm. But I just think the East is better this year. And, yeah. and I really think you don't want to be playing from behind mm -hmm. too early in the schedule. It's going to put a lot of pressure on whichever team ends up starting off slow. Was there anything that like that really impressed you? I mean, you, you did bring up Bo. I, I think Bo, uh, well, um, Butler. Uh, yeah. the, Butler was fantastic. So mm -hmm. I have no problem with the uh, Ticat running game. I thought the defense uh, had some moments. Um, I don't think the secondary is a finished product yet. And Jamal Peters, when he comes back, yeah. he'll be a big help. Um, it's early. I, I, I said to a friend of mine that um, this really should have been the third preseason game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's so hard to evaluate players and install schemes. So I, I am not going to panic. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I, I'd like to see receivers make those tough catches because, I mean, the Tiger Cats, it might have been a different game if, if a couple of those balls had been caught. I think I think they win the game. I, I honestly believe that. I mean, we're looking at Bridges, who's a rookie. Tim White, who is a perennial MVP guy. Uh, yeah, there was the ball thrown a little bit too far, I think. But the great players come up with those those catches in those situations. Not saying that Tim White's not a great player, but <laughs> but certainly I was I I, I I thought it was a touchdown. I was like, oh my God, touchdown! And then oh. Nonetheless, Alouettes beat the Bombers 27-12 in Manitoba to kick off the CFL season. And then in the final game of the week, the Argonauts knock off the Lions 35-27. Your week one biggest surprise. It may not doesn't have to be those games, but what was your biggest surprise in I, week I, one? I was surprised at uh, the Winnipeg Montreal score. I did watch a, a fair amount of that game. Um, Zach Caleros didn't have a great game, but was I, horrible. I'm pretty sure that uh, Winnipeg will be there uh, when the dust clears. I think my biggest surprise from the weekend was the performance of Cameron Dukes for Toronto. I mean, he looked very polished, very seasoned, and he's a very young quarterback put into a tough spot because of the Chad Kelly situation. He played lights out football yesterday. Three touchdown passes. He runs for one. Um, he did fumble one that went back for a touchdown as well. But you're right. The considering it was home, because I thought, you know, what to myself, boy, this might be easier for him if the Argonauts opened up um, on the road. And I know it's not a massive crowd that's in Toronto and they're trying. That's a work in, in progress. But the situation didn't seem too big for him. That's what impressed me. 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, you know, you're, you're the starting quarterback for the team that went undefeated at home last year. There's definitely pressure because everybody's eyes are on him to see, well, how's this guy, how's this guy going to do with our number one guy suspended? And he really responded, and I thought he played very well. I think I might have got a sneak peek that a lot of people didn't see. So this one wasn't a huge surprise to me because I was in Guelph for the Tiger Cats final preseason game against the Argonauts. And here was a situation in that game. The Tiger Cats dressed all their hopefuls, guys that were – possibly going to make the team on the practice roster third and second teamers there were no very few first teamers playing in that game but the Argonauts dressed what there was basically their opening night roster and I thought to myself they still have a really good offensive line maybe the best in the league their defensive line even though some of them you know crossed the track and came to Hamilton they had some guys waiting and they were ready to go Oakman's still there their secondary still strong this isn't a bad team and they have the reigning coach of the year. So should we be surprised if this team doesn't do okay? Maybe not 16 and 2 okay, but with Cameron Dukes, man, and they play and they pay and they face one of the fiercest pass rushers in the league as well too. Uh, yeah, he passed the test. Now he's got to do it week after week after week. That's the big thing, but to me the surprise was Winnipeg. Like Winnipeg, and I know we're still giving no respect to the Montreal Alouettes as reigning Grey Cup champions. It's hilarious to me. We're not getting them, giving them any respect. But, boy, Zach Caleros, who did not take a snap in preseason, it really showed. Yeah, I, I was very surprised at how uh, off off kilter Zach was. Uh, not to mention the fact that, you know, uh, Montreal's defense made life very difficult for him. Mm -hmm. But I think it's fair to say Winnipeg did lose some key pieces. Uh, uh, a couple of free agents left, a couple of retirements. Uh, Mike O'Shea is going to have that, that unit. It's a veteran team. I'm not worried that Winnipeg's going to fall off the cliff. But uh, yeah, Zach's got to play better. Uh, Montreal is the defending Grey Cup champions, and, and they may not get as much respect as they deserve, but Cody Fajardo, uh, is, he's legit. And I think that uh, with some of the new faces Montreal's brought in, you know, they're, they're, they're still the team to beat in the East. Let's talk a little hockey now. Stanley Cup situation on a Saturday night. Beautiful thing. Oilers outshoot the Panthers 32-17, to but they lose game one 3 to nothing. Are you worried about Edmonton's chances? I'm not worried. Uh, I think that Florida had to be considered the favorite going into the Stanley Cup final. Um, Edmonton's a great team, some real offensive stars, but it might come down to the goaltending. And, you know, Sergei Borbowski was fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Connor McDavid, you know, he's going to get his chances. But that's the interesting thing about hockey is a hot goalie can really steal a series for you. Uh, Florida also has the, you know, the uh, experience of having lost in the final last year. And sometimes that can be enough to push a team over the top. Uh, I think it should be a, 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 at least a six game series. But Edmonton, they really kind of need to find some way to beat Bobrovsky, and, and that's going to be difficult. So you're giving me six games, but six games for who? Uh, I, I have to pick Florida. Okay. And it hurts me to say that. Yeah. I am cheering for the Canadian team. I'd love to see the Stanley Cup back in Canada. Mm -hmm. But I really think Florida has shown that they're, they're a very good team, and, uh, and I think they're on a mission this year. I'm concerned. I'll be honest with you. I'll be, I'm really concerned because, to me, that was the game Edmonton needed to win make their mark in game one everything went right their stars played well and you lose to me this is the night where i think florida their star players show up it's almost like that paul maurice said we got the early lead for Hagee scores then we got another one to start the second and we can just put it into defensive gear and lock these guys down because they do play good four line tough physical grinded out kind of hockey and Edmonton don't have four lines to do the same thing they did acquire some guys and Corey Perry they, they don't they can't match up I guess I think physically uh, in the corners and battle and I'm still concerned about the fact that a lot of scoring comes from one line or at least 
two players when it comes to goal scoring, when it comes to the Oilers. I mean, guys like McLeod, like, I don't know, are guys like that going to make a difference? We'll soon, we'll soon find out. Skinner has always been a concern. Yes. Right. Uh, he's been hot and cold. Yeah. Um, if Edmonton doesn't get more production from, you know, Nugent Hopkins and Zach Hyman, uh, it does put a lot of pressure on Dreisaitl and, and McDavid. So yes, Edmonton's going to have to find scoring from other, other players. Um, but I just think Florida is is so fundamentally sound, and Bobrovsky is at the top of his game. And I do believe exactly what you said. There is something to be said about when you losing before you win. And that would be the perfect case for the Florida Panthers after their experience last year, kind of getting dusted pretty well last year by the Vegas Golden Knights. And then in a situation now where they're back again and they're hungry. Now, let's stick with the Stanley Cup here. Sure. I don't know if you noticed this. This became a topic of discussion in the CHCH newsroom. <laughs> I completely missed it. If people don't know about it, here's the situation. Prior to the face-off here, of the Stanley Cup, game one. There's Phil Pritchard, Burlington guy, good Burlington guy. They bring out the Stanley Cup and unveil it to the players and the fans. Now, there are a fraction of people out there and they are right here in my newsroom that say this is complete sacrilege. What do you think? I'm not sure sacrilege is the word I would use, but <laughs> it definitely goes against the tradition. Uh, I think, and you know, you and I are of a same similar era that yep. uh, you don't you don't bring the cup even to the venue until one team is in the position to possibly raise it. So to have it there in game one, it makes me wonder whether it was done for the American TV audience to mm -hmm. kind of show everybody what the Stanley Cup is, since you know uh, the Stanley Cup playoffs are routinely you know touted by all of the announcers. Uh, but yeah, it, 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 it was a little different. I missed it too, like mm -hmm. you, uh, but uh, I probably wouldn't support it. Mm -hmm. But And I'm sure a lot of the Canadian players are saying, hey, what's going on? But uh, I, I don't know if sacrilege is, that might be a little harsh. Well, there, there are people that, they don't, they don't, they, this, is, they, this is ridiculous. Like you can't do this. That, you know, we've gone, we've gone back to satisfying the American audience right that's which, a possibility which which to me i think you need to do don't you like you you got to sell hockey don't you like i don't know i don't feel any different about the stanley cup because it was shown to the crowd and you know and an argument could be said if the oilers if the series started at edmonton would they have done the same thing probably not oh and i and i think that you're bang on when you say you have to educate the audience uh you if you ever watch espn sports center they always refer to it as lord stanley's cup in such reverential <laughs> terms and tones and uh you don't see that in canada as much because canadian audiences they understand what it means and you have to educate the american hockey fan even to this day i think that there's a a fair amount of people who don't understand hockey in the USA. Um, it's grown fantastically over the years, but you know, if you're the audience, if pardon me, if you're the broadcaster, you want to make sure the audience knows what they're watching. So you're 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 putting yourself under the quote traditionalist is what you're telling me. I think so. Yeah, I, I, I as a as a Canadian mm -hmm. and someone who's watched a lot of hockey over the years, I would not like to see the Stanley Cup brought out before one team is in position to to actually win it. Unbelievable. Blue Jays, they've won <laughs> nine of 13. They're undefeated in their last four series. Bill, have they turned the corner? Uh, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> they've been getting better pitching. Uh, they've had some injury woes. Um, uh, I saw a lot of uh, chatter on uh, X this weekend about the Kevin Biggio situation, and I'm wondering if Kevin Biggio was maybe a sacrificial lamb, and they, <laughs> they sent him down because uh, the team wasn't really playing that well, and everybody maybe was kind of startled to say, wow, if, if Kevin could get designated for assignment, maybe I should step up my game. Mm -hmm. It really becomes a question of, of Bo Bichette and Vladdy have not hit like they hit last year. I'm not concerned. Those are real, you know, legitimate players. Um, I think they added some, some new faces and chemistry might be a problem, but uh, I'm not sure they have a, enough pitching depth to really contend this year, mm -hmm. but I think that they'll definitely get better as the season goes on.
Well, I'm still concerned about their hitting, even though they have won some games here. Um, they're still not scoring tons of runs. Um, I, I think it's fair to say, and this isn't the Blue Jays' fault. This isn't any team's fault when this situation comes up. Who did they beat? in these series. I mean, they split versus Baltimore. They got whacked in games one and two and then came back in impressive style with a walk-off win and then grinded out, a, 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 I guess, that afternoon game, which was a fourth game. So they split the series against the Orioles, which is true competition. Everyone else, the White Sox, they're not so good. Oakland, yeah. they, they're not really good. And now they play a team. I think their next two series, their combined records are like 85 and, tw and, and, and 60. Like, they're playing good quality teams now. Milwaukee is a good team that they're going to start off a series against tonight. This will be the true test. They've got to beat good teams now. And win series is a great thing. Because if you win two or three every series, you're going to go into the way the baseball playoffs are set up. You're going to go to the playoffs. You're going to end up with a wild card boss. Right. Uh, yeah, the, the run scoring thing is, is a concern to me. I think their pitching is good. I, I think their pitching's underperformed, to tell you the mm -hmm. truth. I think Kevin Gosman looked great pitching the shutout the other day, right. but he's had a tough start to the year with Alex Manoa going down. That hurts. Um, you know, Chris Bassett, he's going to be pretty solid for them. They may have to make a deal. I am think, and I don't know where they go, mm -hmm. but I would like to see them add another arm if they can, uh, because just the starting staff seems to be a little bit of patchwork. You, you could be right there if they're in contention. I, I think they expected or really, really wanted Alec Manoa to bounce back. And I thought he was showing some signs of life. And I would believe that he's done for the season now. So uh, that fifth starter position definitely is going to be, I don't know if that Bowden Francis is ready for that situation. Uh, you know, especially when we get a little bit later into the season. But yeah, they're certainly going to have to add a pitching, some pitching and, and probably Probably some hitting as well too. I mean, Bo, I, Bo is, I'm, is a concern for me. Vladdy, I think, has is, is coming back. I mean, I talked about this uh, last week. I think in the month of May to June, he raised his his batting average from like 230, 231 up to about 295. So he's coming along. Still no power. It, that's surprising to me. Right. Where's his power? Yeah, I mean, uh, they're not getting power from the traditional power spots. They mm -hmm. Third base, they got a lot of power from third base last year. Um, George Springer seems to be looking for his home run swing. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see. Dal Dalton Varshow, uh, he's supposed to be a power guy, and he hasn't really shown that. So uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, you know, the trade deadline's still a couple months away, right. and uh, it'll be interesting to see if the Blue Jays are buyers or sellers at that point. Basketball, Celtics up two games to nothing versus the Mavs in the NBA Finals. Are the Mavs in a whole lot of trouble, Bill? Uh, I don't know if they're in trouble, but, uh, you know, uh, if I could just, you know, uh, declare that I favor I favored the Celtics going into the series. Mm -hmm. They, uh, again, they lost in the Finals two years ago, so they may be a team on a mission. Um, growing up with the Buffalo Braves, I have no strong feelings for the Boston Celtics, but <laughs> I do appreciate the fact that they've put together a fantastic team. They have the best record in the league. They have a rabid fan base, two young superstars, uh, some veteran guards. Uh, they're really the team to beat. Dallas, uh, I really like Luka Doncic. He, he plays a, an entertaining brand of basketball, but I'm not sure they're ready to beat the Celtics. You know, the, you're right with the Celtics, and this is why I'm concerned for the Celtics, is the fact that Boston were unbelievable in game one. They were lousy in game two. They really were. They're, offensively, they shot the ball, or shot the three at like 25%. Their two best players, the two Jays, were not very good. Yet it was Dallas that kind of allowed them to win the game with all their turnovers. And right. you're and and Luca, I said this to to make a nurse the other day. Like, is he out of shape? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, I don't. It's it's the weirdest thing. He's an incredible athlete. And here, I, I shouldn't be talking about being out of shape. But <laughs> but like the still though, like, I, I'm not an NBA player, but he is right? right. And he seems to be gassed in the fourth quarter at all times. And really, he started to turn the ball over. I think he had like eight turnovers, and he had a triple double, 30 points yeah. again. But if you're turning the ball over, no, not he, good. He doesn't look like your traditional athlete. <laughs> that's for sure. He looks like somebody you'd be playing pickup with at the YMCA. But 
he's a fantastic talent mm -hmm. uh, he's got to play better uh, he's got to cut out the turnovers he's got to get other players involved and he can do that mm -hmm. uh, I don't think Kyrie Irving has really found his stroke mm -mm, yet mm -mm. and uh, you know when those two guys are both going right. they're a very tough team to beat the Minnesota series they were going yes and and uh, the but if one of them is having an off night, the other one, I'm not sure he can pick up the slack. Let's stay with hoops here. Caitlin Clark. Oh, <laughs> Caitlin Clark, another story. She was not selected for the USA women's squad for the upcoming Olympics. Is her absence on this team a missed opportunity for women's basketball? I, I think so. I think it's a huge missed opportunity. And I, I really don't understand the Caitlin Clark dynamic that's kind of you know, manifesting itself. I've been a Caitlin Clark fan since she was a junior at Iowa. I saw her play and I got my son, who's a huge basketball fan. He wants to date Caitlin Clark. He thinks her game is so great. <laughs> and uh, she has just been so much fun to watch. She has done things that no other women's player has done and and I say that with no disrespect to anybody that's come before I'm aware of Cheryl Miller and Rebecca Lobo current players that are in the league Caitlin Clark is the real deal and she is so popular right now the Olympics is the biggest stage for sport in the world and for USA basketball to leave her off that team when they could be promoting women's athletics to the biggest audience that they may ever see is really a mistake. Okay, I, I respect what you're saying there. I'll ask you this question and this will make my mind go either direction. Is she one of the best 12 players in the United States? I'm not sure that that is necessarily the criteria bubs I mean how could it not be if, well, you're, if you're putting together the best team yeah, but you think about um, the, the dream team they had Christian Leitner on it he was mandated to be there um, and you look at this what they announced as Team USA's women's team and there's a player uh, Keisha Gray I believe who hasn't played a game since last year she's injured but they still selected her to play based on past performance. There's also Brittany Griner, who's only played one game this year. So based on what have you done for me lately, there's two players there whose selection could be questioned. But I, I, regardless of, of whose spot she would take, Caitlin Clark should be there if the WNBA is serious about promoting their product. Well, oh, okay, maybe for all-star games in WNBA, but this is the Olympics, isn't this? The, shouldn't this be looked at somewhat differently? Well, maybe, uh, but Diana Taurasi has been to five Olympics. Right. How many is enough? Like, does she really need a sixth gold medal? And I'd like to see veteran players, you know, allow the younger generation to kind of assume those positions. Mm -hmm. I mean, Diana Taurasi doesn't need another gold medal for her trophy case. Six Olympics is too much for me. And even though she's still a great player and producing at a high level, the Olympic experience should be shared. And right now it just seems like it seems like there's more at, at, at play here about Caitlin Clark. Uh, and I don't know whether it's some of the you know unfortunate uh, social and other th factors that are, are being you know race well yeah I didn't want to say it but say you know uh, that that that's a f maybe that's a factor I don't know um, but it doesn't give the sport a good look here's the final question on this they've won seven gold medals in a row I think would it even make a difference, or will it make a difference? No, With all due respect to Team Canada. No, no, I exactly. But that's even more reason to put a new face out there for the future. Like, if Caitlin Clark is going to be the future of USA Basketball on the women's side, why delay her impression on the, the ticket-buying public that you're trying to court? It just doesn't make any sense to me. I will give her credit. I thought her response to the media was was right on point. And then it later came out that she told her point, or told, uh, her, I guess, her really, her true feelings to her coach and said, you've opened up a monster. Listen, uh, if she needs motivation, they just gave it to her. And uh, it's unfortunate that... Uh, you know, 
there's going to be questions that linger around this whole uh, selection process, but uh, Caitlin Clark's going to be okay. She's the real deal. She's going to be the face of the WNBA before long. Last Saturday, Iga Swiatek won her third consecutive French Open singles women's singles title and fifth Grand Slam overall. In golf, Nellie Korda, <laughs> she's entered nine LPGA events this year and won six. Bill, why do no... Yeah, people in their sport, in their respective sport of golf and tennis, know who these names are. Why do no one know about these people? Swiatek's been like the number one player in the world, like replacing Serena Williams. She's been, it's like, yeah. it's over like 120 weeks or something like that. Why do no one know about these women athletes? That's a good question. Uh, I started to hear about Nellie Korda, just because now and then I'll watch a golf tournament on a Sunday afternoon. Um, and so I was aware of her spectacular season. Um, don't watch a lot of women's tennis, maybe the Grand Slams. Uh, I, I, it's hard to say other than Serena dominated women's tennis for so long and uh, there could be some fatigue there and people are maybe not ready to jump on the bandwagon of the new hot star uh, in golf. It, it, it's you know, in, in a, it's incredibly popular, but in some ways it's still a niche sport. You know, if, if it's not Tiger Woods, the everyday fan necessarily doesn't in, be, get interested in golf. Uh, but you're right, they definitely deserve to be uh, recognized more. Um, th what they're doing is, is really impressive, fantastic, spectacular. Um, but it's, it may take a more sustained uh, length of uh, tenure of success before they get that kind of everyday top of mind recognition. Yeah, it's it's crazy to me because to me Swantec is unbelievable. Like she is clearly the world number one in tennis, and it makes me wonder, you know. But then I have to cancel it out because the court is American. But like if, if Swantec was American, then I think everyone would know her name in tennis. Like I I just don't understand. Like and it makes me wonder if women's sports, even though it's come miles, maybe it hasn't come miles enough because these people they're not fly-by-night athletes these are women that are dominating their sports for multiple years now and why they're not getting the <coughs> excuse me the, why they're not getting the commercial time right why they're not on well I don't have Letterman anymore they're not on the, the American <laughs> talk shows like I, I like, or sports they, line or... sports, sports <laughs> line like, like why why where, what's going on here like, well uh, it, it, the only, well, not the only, but one thing that occurs to me is that Tiger Woods and Serena Williams were American. So the American media, which dominates the sports landscape at every level in every sport, is always looking for a good American story. And those two made it easy for American network uh, coverage to kind of take advantage of their popularity. And the two were kind of feeding off each other. The other thing that, um, you, I, I see a lot of coverage in women's tennis, and I, in women's tennis, I'll be honest. You know, if it's not Bianca Andreescu or Lila Fernandez, yep. the Canadian girls, you know, I, I, I don't have a ton of interest. <laughs> but I do notice that the American coverage that we get to see, they're looking for the next American star, whether it's Terry Pagula or Coco Gauff, mm -hmm. or um, there's a couple of other girls who. You know, American girls that they really want to see succeed. So it could just be a little bit of hometown favoritism. It could be because you know what, men's tennis is suffering from the same thing. There, are, there's a new set of American young players on the men's side that are coming up right now that are starting to win, make some inroads and get to finals and and semifinals of major tournaments, uh, Masters, one thousands. But yeah, they're just not. You know, they're not Andy Roddick, right? They're well, not Andre yeah. Agassi. That's right. Right. And and, and I think right now Carlos Alcaraz is going to be the face of tennis for at least the next 10 years if not longer he is an impressive young man at 21 and he's already been in I think four Grand Slam finals and won three right like so Spain yay but you know, the <laughs> USA is still looking for that next guy well as you said we're always looking for you know they're always looking for the next great American or the the next great American story but I was looking I'm always looking for the next great golden horseshoe Southern Ontario <laughs> story and Bill you've been one for a long long time in these parts and uh, I'll tell you 
getting to work with you in that 2019 season, the, the, the circumstances, why it happened, were certainly not something that we, we were happy about no, certainly with, with our guy Steve Clark going down with some illness issues. But uh, getting to work with you and you know knowing you a little bit out and getting emails from you more than anything else about particular teams that were uh, that were winning at McMaster and trying to get some coverage, and that was one level. But getting to, to work with you, uh, it, it, it's a whole new level. And um, we need to have you more on the Sportsline oh. podcast. It, it's been great to have you on, partner. I'll come on anytime you need a, a, you know a, someone to stand a, or what square off with. So, mm-hmm. um, but I really appreciate the invite today, Bubba. And listen, that was that season of playing of uh, covering Marauder football with you on the radio. One of the most fun broadcasting experiences I've ever had. Yeah, it was great. It was great going on the road. They were like, I mean, weren't the road games even better? <laughs> yes, like <laughs> a lot of fun. Yeah, that's that's all you need to know, folks. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. Hey, thanks for joining us. But you'll join us again? Anytime. Right on, my man. Hey, that's your Sportsline podcast for the day. And as you've just seen and heard, we love talking sports. If you do know of an athlete, team, or event to promote the Sportsline podcast, want to hear from you. Please hit the thumbs up and subscribe button. And if you do have something to say, please comment. We really appreciate that. For the wonderful people that make the Sportsline podcast possible, thank you so very much. And we'll see you soon.